Welcome to this video on synchrotron self-interactions. In this video, we're going to start looking at how synchrotron emission interacts with itself, possibly through self-absorption or by scattering off of the same electrons that are causing the synchrotron emission. So we'll begin with synchrotron self-absorption. So you'll recall in a previous lecture that we derived the power pattern, the spectral emission of synchrotron emitting electrons. And for an electron spiraling in a magnetic field, B, we found that due to relativistic beaming effects, we no longer saw emission only at a single frequency the way you would for cyclotron emission, but rather the spectrum of emission from that electron as a function of frequency was highly peaked, which we called the critical cutoff frequency, new cut, which was roughly gamma squared times the cyclotron frequency that you would expect. But because this was synchrotron emission, where we receive emission from this electron only over a very small angle in its orbit around this B field, we have a spread of emission at other frequencies down here where we have a characteristic new to the one-third slope and over here where we have an exponential cutoff with one-half times e to the minus new over new cut. So for most of what we're going to do today we're going to assume that all of the power radiated by a single electron is emitted in this region where its power peaks. So that means that whatever energy we have of our electron corresponds to a Lorentz factor gamma just by relativity. And this gamma in turn corresponds to a particular frequency that we're observing at. So this is fine. We have a single electron out here. It's undergoing acceleration through this magnetic field and it's radiating most of its power at a particular frequency. But what if I add more electrons here? Well, for a while, if we're optically thin, then more electrons directly adds to the amount of power I get out. We get more synchrotron emission. But eventually, if we add enough electrons into this synchrotron mechanism, we're going to become optically thick. And as we know in an optically thick case, more electrons doesn't directly linearly produce more emission. This is because we have self-absorption, which means, in this case, that the intensity of synchrotron emission that we observe asymptotes to some effective source function. And literally what is happening is that an electron being accelerated by a magnetic field over here emits photons that hit a nearby electron spiraling around a similar magnetic field and it gets absorbed by this electron over here. Because as we know, with any emission mechanism, we can always have the reverse process happen. If you can emit at a particular synchrotron frequency, you can also absorb at that same synchrotron frequency. So the more electrons we pile into this region, the more likely it is that synchrotron emission from one of these electrons will hit the next electron over and add its energy to that electron instead of having it come out as radiation that we observe. So that's all well and good, but how do we know when we're about to get optically thick in synchrotron emission? And in some ways, this comes back to what is this source function, which you'll remember is the ratio of the emissivity to the absorption coefficient. Well, one way we can know whether we need to start considering self-absorption is by considering how much intensity we would get out if our source function we're a black body. So I'm going to switch colors here to just indicate that we're doing a thought experiment. So one reason I want to switch colors here is because when we start using the Planck function here, we're implying thermal equilibrium. But I want to make absolutely clear, we are not in thermal equilibrium. We're just doing a thought experiment. So if we did have Planckian emission, what would the temperature of that black body be? So we could set the thermal energy to be roughly equal to the relativistic energy of one of these electrons. And by picking a gamma here, because gammas imply frequencies, we've picked the gamma corresponding to the frequency that we're looking at here. So maybe I'll put a little frequency subscript on my T to say that this is the temperature at a particular frequency, the frequency that corresponds to this gamma over here. And because this is going to be a super high temperature, this black body spectrum is almost guaranteed to peak well above the frequencies that I'm observing at. So I'm going to assume that we're in the Rayleigh genes tail here. And I'll assume we're optically thick so that I knew is roughly 2kt over lambda squared. And because 1 over lambda is proportional to frequency, that 1 over lambda squared is a new cut squared. And my temperature relates to this gamma mec squared has a gamma in it. So I knew in general is going to be proportional to nu squared gamma. And we also remember from up here that gamma is proportional to nu cut to the 1 half. And the cyclotron frequency here had a dependence on the magnitude of the magnetic field in it. So gamma is also proportional to b to the minus one half. So if I plug that in down here, that means that 
my specific intensity is going to be, in general, proportional to nu to the 5 halves times b to the minus 1 half. Now remember, we're not in thermal equilibrium, but a black body is a perfect emitter and a perfect absorber. So if your specific intensity, as predicted for a black body, in the optically thick case, then this effectively defines an upper limit for what the specific intensity from synchrotron emission could possibly be. So because black bodies are perfect emitters and absorbers, the maximum intensity we could possibly observe, we have a maximum specific intensity which is some constant that depends on the various constants that we've swept under the rug here, times nu to the 5 halves times the magnetic field to the minus 1 half. And I've changed colors back to black here because this maximum does not depend on thermal equilibrium. This maximum used the fact that black bodies are perfect emitters and absorbers to argue for an upper limit to the emission that we can get from synchrotron emission. So suppose I'm observing synchrotron emission, which has some characteristic power spectrum slope. As we've learned in earlier lectures, this slope is determined by the energy spectrum of the electrons and generally has a negative slope so that it's getting brighter and brighter as we go lower and lower in frequency. Now at some point what happens is we pick a frequency here and from that frequency we compute a gamma factor and from that gamma factor we determine the maximum emission that we could get from a black body with a temperature corresponding to that energy. And if we drew the black body spectrum for that temperature we might find that we're just on the border of hitting against the maximum possible intensity that we could observe. So what happens if we go to another frequency that's a little bit lower? Well at a lower frequency our implied gamma is smaller which means our implied temperature is smaller which means that we have a different black body curve that corresponds to that temperature. And this spectrum represents the maximum possible intensity that we could observe. So what we will find is that instead of observing emission up here it has itself absorbed and we now observe it to fall down here at the maximum possible intensity for a black body. And the remaining emission, the difference between these two curves, got self-absorbed. It went back into heating up these relativistic electrons that were cooling down as they were emitting synchrotron emission. And at an even lower frequency, we have an even lower temperature and therefore an even lower maximum intensity. So at the end of the day, we observe a synchrotron spectrum that follows a power law at high frequencies but has a characteristic turnover at a characteristic frequency below which it follows a power law determined by this nu to the 5 halves. And that turnover from self-absorption tells you important information about the magnetic fields in which these electrons are moving. So that was synchrotron self-absorption. Now we're going to talk about another synchrotron self-interaction. It's called synchrotron self-Compton. So remember what Compton scattering is. It's when you have a photon coming in, it hits an electron here, and it Compton scatters into a lower energy photon plus an electron that now has a little bit of kinetic energy. Remember, there's an inverse Compton scattering as well. And in inverse Compton scattering, we have some lower energy photons coming in. We have a highly relativistic electron moving here. And in the process of scattering, we end up with a higher energy photon that gained energy from this relativistic electron. And in fact, when we talk about synchrotron self-Compton, we're talking about this inverse Compton scattering process. Remember, the ingredients for any Compton scattering interaction are photons and electrons, and in particular, for inverse Compton scattering, relativistic electrons. Now, these same relativistic electrons, in the presence of a B field, produce photons. So, here we have relativistic electrons, which were already a fundamental ingredient of synchrotron emission, and, in the presence of a B field, produce exactly the kind of photons that could scatter off a relativistic electron to produce even more energetic photons. So it's not crazy to think that synchrotron emission and inverse Compton scattering can easily go hand in hand. All that we need are high densities of photons and electrons. Now I'll point out that these kinds of interactions are the ways that you generate some of the most powerful high energy emission in the universe. So this is how you make uber photons. So suppose we start with a synchrotron power spectrum that obeys this power law over a certain interval, which means it has some minimum gamma for the relativistic electrons that are floating around, and it has some maximum gamma, which, is, which are the highest energy electrons that are sitting around. Now you'll recall in our derivation of inverse Compton scattering that the average energy of a photon out was related to the average energy of a photon in times 4 thirds. Now the assumption here is we're going really close to the speed of light, so we'll drop our beta squared term here, call it 1. 
So what this means is that incoming photons are processed by an inverse Compton scattering into outgoing photons that have approximately gamma squared times the incoming frequency. So you can imagine what's going to happen is that we'll get a new high energy tail to our original synchrotron power spectrum coming from these inverse Compton scatterings. But here's the tricky part. We have a bunch of different incoming photons over the whole range of this input spectrum, the black spectrum on the left here. But we also have a whole range of gammas ranging from gamma min to gamma max. So photons don't just have to scatter off of the exact energy electrons that made them. They can scatter off electrons that have higher or lower energy than the particular electrons that happen to make this photon. So to work out the form of this higher energy tail to the synchrotron spectrum here that's added from synchrotron self Compton, we need to work out a few details. Suppose we have a source function, the original source function, which is this one over here, S nu, that obeys some power law. So it goes as frequency to the alpha. And just as a reminder, remember this alpha for the frequency spectrum is related to the energy index of the electrons. It's 1 plus p over 2, where p was that energy index of the electrons. And let's also assume that we are optically thin. So we have a tau associated with synchrotron self-Compton. I'll put a little SSC down here to indicate that this is not the same optical depth as what we we're talking about for synchrotron self-absorption. This is for self-Compton. And we're going to assume that that is much less than 1. So we're optically thin. And in general, so we can assume that we basically have a single scattering. We don't rescatter scattered photons. So then we ask, what is the output spectrum here, S prime of nu? Well, because we're optically thin, we know it should go linearly with optical depth. And for all of the photons that it can scatter off of, from nu min to nu max in the source function, I'm going to put a little prime here to indicate that this frequency right here is a frequency that we're going to integrate over. For each of those photons in the source function, we can scatter off of a electron with gamma ranging from gamma min to gamma max. And each scattering event will just assume translates an input energy, h nu in, to an output energy, h nu out, times gamma squared. So we have a delta function here that relates our input frequency to an output frequency. So, so nu out divided by gamma squared is going to be the same as our input energy. It's going to be the same as our input frequency nu prime. And that's going to be integrated over nu prime, so it'll integrate over all of the frequencies in the input source spectrum. But then we're also going to integrate over all of the electrons that are out there, which we'll also assume follows a power law with some normalization and zero times gamma to the p. Now because gammas are energies, we can say that the change in the number of electrons with gamma is equal to the change in the number of electrons with respect to energy. And this is just the same power law that we have been saying being proportional to gamma to the p. All right, so we've integrated over all the incoming photon energies with our d nu prime. Now we have to integrate over all of the electron energies which are our gammas, so d gamma. All right, so we do a little algebra here. Our tau for synchrotron self Compton remains out here. In our source function, s nu, we had a constant, normalization constant, c0. Our constant n0 also floats out here. Now let's see, the frequency to the minus alpha, which we had right here, so we have a new prime to the minus alpha in this source function here. Uh, and that new prime is constrained to be nu over gamma squared here. So when we integrate over frequency, we'll be left with our integral over gamma, but we're going to have a nu over gamma squared whole thing to the power of alpha as we replace nu prime with nu over gamma squared. And we retain our gamma to the p over here, uh, d gamma. And the last thing we have to remember is that alpha and p are actually related to one another. So I get my constants out here, and now that I've integrated over frequency, my nu is a constant here, so I'll have a C0 nu to the alpha out here, which you'll recognize as our original photon spectrum, times N0. Now we're integrating over, we have a gamma to the P, and then we have a 1 over gamma squared to the alpha, so that's a 1 over gamma to the 2 alpha, 
and alpha up here, you can see two, two alpha is going to be one plus p. So this is gamma to the p over gamma to the p plus one. So this just turns into the integral of one over gamma from gamma min to gamma max. So this whole thing is just the natural log gamma max over gamma min. So what we have here is that our final output scattered spectrum related to the optical depth of synchrotron cell Compton times the original source spectrum times N0, something that has to do with the electron density, times the natural log of lambda, where lambda is defined to be gamma max over gamma min. Now this is a little misleading because you might think that you didn't gain any energy here because the scattered photon spectrum obeys the same power law as the input photon spectrum here. But in fact, the ranges over which this applies have shifted. We have a new new max that came from over here, and that new max was equal to gamma squared times new prime max. And we had a new min that was equal to gamma squared times new prime min. Now, of course, we have a lot of different gammas to choose from here, but this side of the scattered spectrum is going to be new min over here, this new min times gamma min squared. And this copy of the spectrum is going to be shifted, it's going to be stretched out compared to the other copy. And the other upper end is going to be new max times gamma max squared. And in between, we have contributions from new min times gamma max and new max times gamma min. So this is how we get a higher energy tail onto our original synchrotron spectrum. And there are a couple things worth noting here. This tau also nominally is related to the number of electrons. So this is also proportional to N0, which means that the energy of our scattered photon spectrum is proportional to the electron density squared. And also because our frequencies were all upshifted by a factor of gamma squared, the total luminosity of our inverse Compton scattered spectrum is going to be of order gamma squared times tau times the luminosity of our original synchrotron spectrum. So the thing you're going to remember about synchrotron self-Compton is that the electrons are doing work twice. They work once in the number of upscatterings that happen, and they work again in the energy imparted per upscattering. Now while we're on the subject of inverse Compton scattering, there's one more interesting effect to talk about, which is called a Compton catastrophe. Now in synchrotron self-Compton, we had a compact object that was upscattering photons. And we assumed we were optically thin so that our original flux from a source became that plus this new upscattered portion, F prime. And we assumed that just one scattering happened and that made one copy of the spectrum at higher energies. But what if we are optically thick? What if tau is of order one or bigger? Then upscattered photons can get scattered again. Well, let's compare the amount of energy we got from inverse Compton scattering compared to the original. Our LIC we know from inverse Compton scattering is equal to 4 thirds times the Thomson cross-section times C times the energy density of the photon field times beta squared times gamma squared. And this was just something that we worked out from our derivation of inverse Compton scattering. We also have in our derivation of the power from synchrotron the luminosity of synchrotron emission being 2 times the Thomson cross-section times the speed of light times the energy density of the magnetic field UB times beta squared times gamma squared. There's also a sine squared alpha, which averaged over all of our inclination angles comes out to be about two thirds. So you'll see that we end up with a four thirds in this case as well. So if I were just asking, what is the ratio of our inverse Compton scattering luminosity to our original synchrotron luminosity? This comes out to be the energy density of the photon field over the energy density of the magnetic field. And as we derived up here, is equal to is of order gamma squared tau. So if we call this thing here, we'll define it to be um, a factor f, then if we have multiple scatterings, what's gonna happen is we will take our original luminosity from our synchrotron emission, and we're gonna multiply it by one plus you know, f for the first scattering, f squared for a second scattering, f to the third, and so on however many scatterings happen to get some total luminosity. Now if f is bigger than 1, if we have a, t a tau that is of order 1, or if our gammas are very large and tau is actually can be smaller than 1, uh, we can still end up with an f that's bigger than 1. So we don't even need tau greater than or of order 1. We can have tau greater than or of order 1 over gamma squared. And in this case, f is bigger than 1, our total luminosity diverges. 
And this is what's called a Compton catastrophe. So when does it stop? Well, it has to stop when the electrons and photons come into equilibrium with each other. It has to stop when we have a brightness temperature whose energy is of order the kinetic energy of our electrons. If you pick a gamma to be 100 or 1,000, you can get brightness temperatures of order 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And this is about as bright as anything in the universe that we observe. It comes from the most compact objects undergoing Compton catastrophe of synchrotron generating electrons producing photons that then scatter again off of the relativistic electrons over and over again. And that's the Compton catastrophe as relates to synchrotron self-Compton. So thanks for joining this video on synchrotron self-interactions, where we covered synchrotron self-absorption and synchrotron self-Compton scattering.